I mean, I had a friend who like worked at a local news outlet and they were just shut down one day um, by the owner and sold off and they wiped the website. And so th- I think they ended up, the, the newspaper ended up being bought and the archives were restored. But like for a few days, everyone who had worked there literally thought like everything I had published to this like news website is gone. Uh, and I like, I remember hearing the story and I felt so ill because I think that's like that's such a fear because you know the idea of just a website going completely dark the next day is super extreme but you know when all of our content I guess just sort of lives online and you know we can't really touch or see it in real life there is this sort of sense of impermanence and you know the fact that like one day one day this website will probably be obsolete Hello and welcome to Freelance Pod. My name's Sachandrika Chakrabarti and I'll be your host. Freelance Pod is all about how the internet has revolutionised work and our lives. Each episode, I invite a guest from a creative field to tell me about how the internet's transformed or invented their job. I love hearing from you, so if you enjoy the podcast, please do rate, review and subscribe over on Apple Podcasts and tell a friend as well. You can also sign up for the Freelance Pod newsletter, which comes out every time there's a new episode, which is about every week. So you can find the sign up at tinyletter.com forward slash Freelance Pod. That's all one word. The podcast is also on social, so you can find it on Twitter at Freelance underscore pod underscore, on Instagram at Freelance Pod, all one word. And there's a group on Facebook, so just search Freelance Pod. According to a recent survey by Review, an editorial newsletter tool, Delia Kai's newsletter, Dee's Links, is the fourth most popular newsletter among US media professionals. She rolls in there just after newsletters by big names, Neiman Lab, Axios Media Trends, and APIs Need to Know. Dee's Links actually beat Digiday Media's newsletter, which sits in fifth place. This is a big achievement for an individual, particularly someone who's been working full time over the past three and a bit years that she's been writing the daily newsletter. Delia is currently growth and trends editor for BuzzFeed, based in New York. She started the newsletter in 2016, when she was an intern at Atlantic Media. She wrote brand newsletters in that role, so when she started her own, she made a conscious choice to write a different kind of newsletter. So what is these links all about? Well, it's one link emailed to you with the kind of blurb that a friend would write. It feels like, read this and we can talk about it later over a drink or dinner or brunch. One link, one carefully thought over and chosen link. That's the deal. That's what's got these links into the top five alongside some heavy hitters. If you enjoy this episode on newsletters, do check out Caroline Crampton and Anna Cogiorado's appearances on Freelance Pod. Now let's go and ask Delia how she did it. So my name is Delia Kai and I am a writer and editor living in New York. So I have like a, a date, I guess like a full-time job uh, as an editor at BuzzFeed. And then I've been doing some freelance writing um, on the side, just like after work or on weekends. Yeah, so that was really crazy. Um, I had seen the survey go out originally a few, I think it was like a few weeks ago, and someone from the uh, the platform review who had kind of hosted the survey had just like reached out to me and they're like, oh, just so you know, we're doing this survey about media newsletters. If you want to promote it to your readers, um, you know, you should totally do that. And I was like, yeah, sure. Like, I I don't really know a lot about this platform. And, you know, maybe it would just sort of be funny to see if I could get my name on it. Um, And so I was really surprised. I'd kind of forgotten about it. And then when it came out a few weeks ago and had my newsletter, Dee's Links, um, kind of so far up there as number four, I was sort of like, whoa, like, oh, my God, I, I was kind of couching it in my head where I was like you know it's not like it was a very scientific survey and you know it's it's from this kind of email newsletter platform so it's sort of like a smaller community but like 
still like, oh my God, this is so cool. Um, and it kind of, I've been working on this newsletter for more than three years, um, just as this passion project. And so it was just kind of very validating to sort of see that like, you know, I've essentially been working on this every day. I've been sort of building up a readership from like my small group of friends when I was an intern. Um, and it was just very cool to see that, you know, I kind of reached out and told um, my subscribers like, oh, if you want to vote for, you know, these links in this, that would be cool. And to sort of realize like, oh, people actually kind of cared enough about my passion project to want to show their support. And they kind of really showed up. And that was just, it made me kind of emotional. <laughs> So I have just over 1,000 subscribers now. It's kind of this like extension almost of just the things that like I post about on Twitter anyway. And so I think they're a combination of like extending kind of like, I guess, like my platform to this newsletter. I have been able to form a lot of friendships sort of between Twitter and the newsletter where um, someone will reach out and just say like, oh, I've been reading this newsletter for a long time and I really love it. And um, we'll sort of just strike up like an email sort of friendship um, and then we'll like follow each other on Twitter or kind of keep in touch that way. So I think um, I think I've, I've gotten a lot of feedback in that the sort of personality and the voiciness does kind of make the newsletter a little bit different. And um, that was always my intention. Like I kind of just wanted to come off as like a friend who just like loves to dish about what's going on. And um, I'm really glad that that's kind of worked and that's resonated with people. So I started this newsletter when I was an intern um, at Atlantic Media, and I was actually like one of the two interns writing our sort of internal corporate newsletter. Um, so it's really funny that you say that it's sort of this departure from a corporate newsletter kind of field, because that's what I was working on a lot of the time during my internship. And I realized that like I really loved sort of putting it together and curating this information but a lot of the times um, I kind of have to like, I really want to put some personality into it because I think, you know, a lot of just the goings on in the media industry, it's just like kind of too funny or too ridiculous sometimes to not make light of it. Um, but I had to sort of be like, oh, no, no, like this is an internal newsletter that goes out to everyone in the company. So I kind of like can't do that, which is what gave me the idea to eventually uh, started a newsletter of my own where it was sort of kind of delivering this same sort of news, but with more commentary, with more personality. Um, Cause I just, I think I was just like so passionate about a lot of these things that I just wanted to be like, this is so crazy. And here's why and kind of communicate um, the sort of resonance that this kind of stuff had with me. Um, so I also um, had gotten the idea that I wanted to create something really voicey and personal because I had been reading this newsletter called Today in Tabs, and it was written by Rusty Foster, who was this guy who like didn't even work in media. He just lived in Maine and was just sort of very connected into like what was going on. And he wrote this newsletter every day, um, and I read it when I was an intern, and I loved it so much because it was basically just a big roundup of, like, here are the biggest stories, here are the biggest sort of, like, Twitter feuds, here's what's going on basically in media in a snapshot today. And he was just, like, totally kind of irreverent and snarky and funny, and I loved it so much. Um, and he only did it for two years and then ended up just shutting down the shutting down the newsletter and kind of, I think, living his, like, Oh, normal life without it. Um, and so that was like another, that was a huge source of inspiration. And then kind of like, I guess the third source of inspiration was this um, sort of like new social media network that was being started by Andrew Golis, um, who at the time he'd started it as he was like a, an entrepreneur in residence at the Atlantic. Now he's, um, I think now he's like general manager at WNYC and he was like a huge guy at Vox for a while, but he had started this sort of social media network where it's kind of like Twitter, but you were only allowed to share one link every day. And so the idea was that, you know, people would only share something that really, really mattered that sort of really represented their passions and their tastes and whatever. Um, and I really loved that idea. And I um, had like signed up to be on this network and like, loved poking around and seeing what people were sharing. 
um, and kind of loved how different of an experience it was than versus like Twitter where you're, everyone's just kind of spouting off at the mouth like every, you know, three seconds. Um, but uh, this network, which is literally called this, like T-H-I-S period, um, ended up shutting down too because it was like a startup and it wasn't able to, I think, secure funding or figure out a way forward. And so I was really sad about that, but I just remember thinking like this, this one a day format is so interesting because I think it adds like a little more, I guess, like weight to what you end up promoting because people will sort of have this idea of like, oh, of all the things, like why, why are you telling me to read this one thing today? Um, and so all of those kind of factors just combined into this one newsletter where I was like, yeah, I could like send out one link a day and, and sort of write why people should read it. Um, because also selfishly, I was like, that seems like a like a doable workload <laughs> to do every day. And I was, I think, kind of hilariously mistaken about that at some points, but it's been really fun. And I'm kind of very pleased that it ended up distinct distinguishing my newsletter from the rest because there's so many others out there and there's so many good ones and um and I feel like we're in this newsletter renaissance so it's still kind of like hard to stick out. Delia graduated from the University of Missouri Columbia with a bachelor's degree in journalism in 2015. In March 2016 she began an internship at the Atlantic in New York. So I, so my internship right out of college was sort of in this role that where I wasn't writing um, any, I was like writing sort of corporate memos and putting together PowerPoints and stuff. And then my first job out of that was working on the marketing team um, at the Atlantic. And there I was also putting together sort of these like presentations for clients and doing a very specific kind of writing for clients and marketing. And when I wanted, realized that I wanted to sort of make the jump towards a more editorial role, I was sort of really nervous about it because I was like, you know, I, I'm applying for the same jobs as people who have published clips. Um, and I kind of don't like, I, you know, I guess I'll show them the things that I've written for advertisers or, or whatever, but it's definitely different. Um, and I just remember when I was interviewing for the job that I have now at BuzzFeed, my manager at the time was like, you know, I would ordinarily have you take like an edit test and to sort of prove that you can, you know, write in like the BuzzFeed voice or the, the BuzzFeed style um, and kind of be funny and stuff. And he's just like, but I subscribe to your newsletter and I'm reading that and I love it. And so I don't think you need to take this test. Like this, this newsletter proves to me that you can do this very different kind of writing than, you know, what your current marketing experience would give you. So, you know, we don't like, I, I have no doubts about that. And that was really cool because I, I sort of had kind of forgotten about the fact that my newsletter does kind of count as this like body of work in the same way that, you know, other people will have their clips and, and stuff. But um, I have this newsletter and that's that's not nothing either. <laughs> At this point, Delia and I got talking about how precarious jobs in the media can be. Her passion project has become an editorial outlet that she can feel in charge of. And it's important to have that feeling of stability in a very volatile industry what you said about how, you know, this is like kind of your body of work and no one can take it away from you is it sort of really resonates because I think, you know, when you're in the media industry, you know, it's so volatile and you're kind of, it takes you a while to kind of find your niche, I think. And so, you know, maybe you end up getting hired at this place, but, you know, they really kind of want a specific voice or a specific style that isn't, you know, sort of really yours, but you adopt it because you're working there or you go, um, you know, somewhere else and it's just kind of like a whole different style of writing or reporting. Um, and sort of you also have to adopt that. Like, I think that's such a huge part of the job that I think sometimes it's, um, like, I think if I were, if I were like a full-time writer doing that and kind of moving through jobs at different places, um, I think I would appreciate having these links even more because it's sort of like my, uh, I guess like kind of like my base camp, like in a way, like I can always come back to this and I know that this is sort of really me and really what I care about above everything else. And, um, you know, I don't have to worry about one day waking up and someone decides like, oh, you, you don't want, you shouldn't be writing your newsletter anymore. 
or like, um, I mean, I had a friend who like worked at a local news outlet and they were just shut down one day, um, by the owner and sold off and they wiped the website. And so I think they ended up, the, the newspaper ended up being bought and the archives were restored. But like for a few days, everyone who had worked there literally thought like everything I published to this like news website is gone. Uh, and I like, I remember hearing the story and I felt so ill because I think that's a, like, that's such a fear because, you know, the idea of just a website going completely dark the next day is super extreme. But, you know, when all of our content, I guess, just sort of lives online and, you know, we can't really touch or see it in real life, there is this sort of sense of impermanence. And, you know, the fact that like one day, one day this website will probably be obsolete um, or sold or rebranded. And I don't know what will happen to my work. And so I think, you know, even like, even though my newsletter is, is like hosted on a different, on a platform, um, I still feel like a way more direct sense of ownership. Um, and I had actually been thinking, I was like, you know, I should probably back all of these things up because yeah, like one day, what if this is all gone? And like, how am I going to show people what I did for three years? Um, so yeah, yeah, I, there's definitely this sense of greater sense of ownership for sure. Here Delia tells me about how she curates that one perfect link and the text around it for each day's newsletter. Um, I mean, it depends on the day, but I, I usually just sort of, I think like mostly out of habit, um, kind of make it a point to sort of be, be, uh, be checking in with Twitter and like reading the newsletters in my inbox and checking in with my friends. Like I have a bunch of great group chats, especially with a bunch of other, um, young women in media where we sort of talk about what we're reading, what we're thinking about and, um, kind of just see what sort of organically comes across my way, which I think is sort of such a, uh, like a symptom of like the media industry now, or even, even though I'm in it, I still kind of expect like the right things will find me. Um, so like sometimes if I, if, if, you know, the kind of the whole day goes by and I still haven't seen anything, I usually like start checking a few, uh, favorite websites or favorite like writers, um, Twitters, but usually like I, I'll end up finding something, you know, either like around lunchtime or the afternoon and I'll save it. Um, and I can always tell like when it will be a good link because, I want to immediately send it to my friends and sort of be like, you guys have to read this now and here's why. Um, and so I kind of just use that as sort of as the standard to figure out like, oh, when is something good enough? Um, and I also just sort of, I use like pocket a lot. I know that like if I open something big, I can just save it, read it on the train home or something. Um, and then usually I think, I, and then I usually sort of have been thinking about it for much of the day. And so when I am, kind of writing it at night after work or like after dinner, um, it comes like, it comes fairly quickly and usually takes like maybe a half hour or an hour, an hour just uh, depending. I think um, a lot of it is just sort of it, from a symptom of just kind of like being maybe in like almost to a detrimental effect of being really plugged into just what's going on, like media, Twitter and everything. Um, and I, and like, luckily I sort of like have a job in media, so I can kind of like justify it in that, like, you know, I'm just learning more about my industry, just, you know, spending all this time on Twitter. It's for my professional development. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I think it kind of is this great, I guess, like sort of personal, like, like streak, like my, like my friends and I were talking about the idea of like having a streak. Delia is talking about a Snapchat streak or snap streak. This is when two people send snaps to each other every day. It could be pictures, could be video, but it's not just like a written message, like a text that you can do in Snapchat. Every consecutive day they manage this glorious feat of friendship, their streak gets longer. A streak is shown next to a contact's name in Snapchat with a flame emoji and the number of days. Only the two people involved in the streak can see this. So it's kind of private, it's kind of special, it's kind of like an achievement between the two of you. That's part of the Snapchat streak explainer for the Childnet International Informational. I had a dim awareness of what a snap streak is when Delia mentioned it, but I couldn't have explained it myself. What I like about the definition of the snap streak and how it inspires Delia's newsletter 
is that it's a form of communication that sums up 20-something friendships in a city so well. For those of us beyond the age, <clears throat> the 30s here, um, <laughs> we know that level of friendship intensity has to end someday. Those people, your people, with whom you shared those bits from your day, your favourite things from the internet, your everyday failures and triumphs. The online is an extension of your close IRL friendship and the contents of your snap streaks and emails spill over into your dinners and brunches and group holidays. It's seamless. It's hard to maintain those kinds of friendships, friends as family, into your 30s and beyond when you start getting into inventing your own future. But every now and then, don't you miss it? And I think that feeling, either nostalgia or you're living it right now, is what's behind the success of these links. It feels like a part of those close-knit, even entwined, best friendships. Like, my friends and I were talking about the idea of, like, having a streak the other day, um, kind of in the context of, like, Snapchat and, like, maintaining that, like, interaction with, with somebody on your on your Snapchat friends list. Um, but it does feel good because I think, uh, especially, like, when I've had jobs that don't involve, like, publishing, you know, X amount of things by the end of the day, or and it sort of involves, like, projects that are a little more long-term or that just sort of feel a little more nebulous that, you know, at the end of the day, I can still kind of go home and be like, well, I, you know, I did publish something today and that was for my newsletter. Um, and I think just keeping that sort of muscle of like finding something interesting, recognizing that it's interesting, figuring out like a way to add a little like, like value or like color um, around it in the form of commentary. And then like, editing it kind of myself and sending it out it, it's sort of um I think it's made me a better and stronger writer and now that I am at BuzzFeed writing a lot it I think it's helped so much because being able to sort of work that quickly um with with a with a sense of confidence um has has been really crucial it's it's interesting because I feel like the reason like I really love my newsletter is that because it's sort of this more closed ecosystem and I kind of know that it's I'll have an easier time kind of like having my newsletter stand out in someone's inbox versus like my tweet in someone's timeline, because that's, just, it's just like on an order of scale, like just so much bigger, it'll definitely get lost. Whereas I like the newsletter format so much because you know people check their email all the time and, you know, it's sort of this very, it's maybe like one of the last sort of like personal kind of digital spaces because you know, it's where you like get your work done and it's where you make plans with friends and, you know, oftentimes how you talk to your parents. And so it's this really personal space that people pay very close attention to. And so being able, like having someone subscribe to my newsletter and essentially being invited into their inbox every day, it sort of feels like being let into someone's inner circle for sure. And so I think figuring out how to kind of nurture that relationship with readers versus just, you know, blabbing away on social media is, is they, it is sort of like kind of two different um, relationships to have. But I found that for the most part, like my kind of Twitter circle, I guess, is very similar to my newsletter circle. Um, but that's might just be a symptom of like how small the media, the overall media circle is. So I first started these things with, with tiny letter and they kind of um, gave you like no analytics. Like I think you kind of go in and see how many people subscribed and how many people opened uh, your newsletter, but that was it. And so that was kind of a big part of why I moved to Substack um, was because I wanted to see like what other information that they could give you. And um so right now I kind of just look at, um, I, open rate is kind of my biggest metric. Um, and then I also like keep track of like how many subscribers I have. Um, and then they also sort of show you, which is cool. They show you kind of like where you're getting, where you're getting referrals from. If they like kind of just come to the website for the newsletter and read it, um, where those people are coming from. But, um, I think, I think open rate is most important to me because, I, um, my goal isn't necessarily like, like I would love it if everyone, um, actually clicked on the link that I include every day, but sometimes like, you know, if, if they're busy or whatever, and 
the, they just want to open the letter, scan it and sort of get a takeaway from it. Like, I guess my goal is to sort of be like, here's what you should read and here's why. But if you don't have time, like here's kind of like a little takeaway or something you can say about it. If it like comes up in conversation, you can sort of like refer to it and sound really smart without actually having to read it. Um, And so I think, so for me, I just want to know, you know, like who's actually looking at this every day. And um, if they're clicking through, that's great. Um, If they're, uh, tweeting about it or like promoting it themselves like that's even more amazing than I know that they sort of really believe in in this and get a lot of use out of it um but other than that I don't really I don't really like keep track of anything else um and I feel like I'm at the point where maybe I should start looking at kind of more like the next level of analytics that would be available to me but um I think for now just kind of, just because it's kind of still this fun thing that I do um, my ego is like, uh, is satisfied enough just knowing like, Oh, like this many people like opened it today, you know, <laughs> the importance of, of these links as a passion project has kind of really impressed itself on me in, in the past few, in these sort of first few years that I've been out of college. Um, because I think, a lot of the times it sort of sounds like, oh, you know, to have like a whole project outside of work, like that sounds exhausting. You know, it's kind of the bad rep that like the side hustle economy has. Um, and there have been like days when I'm sort of like, oh, like I don't, can I just like not write something tomorrow and will anyone notice? And like sometimes I don't and really like not a lot of people notice. And so it's it's kind of nice to be able to like set your own like I guess like hours in that way but um I think especially as someone who is still starting out in this this industry herself um having a project that you sort of really believe in um and that just makes you feel really good and excited about about things and, and your own talent um makes all the difference especially when you're first starting and you're not sure you know what you want to do or where you want to be or even like you know in those first few jobs when you're sort of like this is this is not this is a good job it's not the dream job you know and so it's sort of like it kind of makes the days it sort of dignifies your work I think through the day because you know in the back of your head that like you know even if I don't if I'm not crazy about this specific task or this specific job I have right now I'm still working on something that I'm proud of and that I'm, I'm excited about. And that enthusiasm kind of gives me the energy to keep going and then sort of plan my next move. And in a lot of the cases, like my newsletter has sort of helped me sh- figure out like what that next move is, because I think um, like for a long time, I was like, you know, I, I like this newsletter thing. Maybe I'll just like really get into, you know, the whole newsletter side of things and apply for jobs on newsletter teams and stuff um but then I sort of realized that like oh actually like the the act that I really love of of doing this newsletter of doing these links is the sort of like curation and then the writing and then kind of just encouraging like fostering community and so now I'm at the point where I'm like you know I don't know I still don't really know like what my dream job would be in a few years or in 10 years but I know that like these these sorts of activities are, are what like kind of give me life in, in a, in a sort of like very reductive way to, to put it. Um, and, you know, as long as, you know, as I look towards the future, I'll be looking for roles and positions that where I can kind of put those sort of skills to work. And so even if I can't articulate what, what it is that I eventually want, I think, um, doing this project and kind of having something to like put my energy into and my creative energy into um, helps me sort of shape the direction that I think I want to go in. So I guess um, in terms of the three tips, I guess like what one is to sort of figure out, um, you know, what you are passionate about because it doesn't have to be a media newsletter. It could be like an Instagram, an Instagram account about, like llamas and that could just be your really fun like 
outlet. And if you if you care about it, if you have so much passion for it, it will show and it will be great. Um, and then I think my other, like, I guess, like, my second tip is um, to not worry about, like, monetizing it right away. Because I, I think worrying about that stuff, it kind of takes the fun out of it at first, especially when you're just starting out. Um, because then, then it really does just become a side hustle and it just becomes another job. And, and I think right now, like, I've had a lot of conversations with people who are like, you know, are you going to start like charging subscription? Like what's going on with this? And right now I'm still kind of against doing that because I think these links is this great sort of outlet, not only to sort of like get exposure just for like my work and my ideas, but um, I kind of like that. It's this sort of low pressure sort of like playground for myself in terms of like experimenting or being weird or whatever. And, to like at least have one part of my like I guess professional life like not tied to strictly to performance or or like money is it's really freeing um and that way it sort of feels more like a hobby than a side hustle for sure um and then I guess my third my third tip would be to really celebrate um your projects and your like in your own dedication in a, in a way. And I, I say this because when my newsletter like turned three years old uh, in February this year, I was like, you know what, I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw a birthday party for my newsletter. Um, and I had been inspired by like a friend, Abigail, who did the same thing for hers. Um, and so I like invited all my friends. I invited all the people um, in my subscribers um, and I like got a cake and I, I bought all these balloons, all these letter balloons to spell out these links um, and like picked a bar and like set up the balloons and cake and like borrowed like an outfit from a friend. And it was just so like extra um, to the point where I was a little embarrassed about it because I was just like, oh, my God, like, you know, I first planned this party because I thought it'd be kind of funny but now I'm a little like I'm a little embarrassed because it's sort of weird to invite your friends and be like come celebrate the fact that I've been doing this project for three years um with me you know but I had just so many friends from college and from work and even like just from like Twitter who came and they're like this is so great that you're celebrating this like we like support you and you should celebrate it because you know, three years is a long time. Writing a newsletter is hard work. And, you know, so much of what we do in this industry can be really lonely. And it's just you and a laptop most of the time and being able to bring all of your friends and your like colleagues together and sort of be like, wait, I did this really great thing. And I'm proud of myself. And they're, and then they in return are like, yes, we're proud of you too. Like it's, it was like a little bit transcendent and it was just very validating. And I think I think a huge way to, I think, stay inspired and not get burned out in such a industry that's pr that's prone for that, and sort of just celebrating your accomplishments and and um and I like dignifying that experience. <laughs> I love that Delia had a birthday party for Dee's Links. I think there's been so much wisdom and great advice in what she said on today's episode. Thanks for your time, Delia. That's all for another episode of Freelance Pod. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please do tell a friend. And it would help me if you could rate, review and subscribe over on Apple Podcasts. Just search for Freelance Pod and you'll see a little cartoon version of my face. You can also sign up for the newsletter, which comes out every time there's a new episode, which is about every week. So you can find that at tinyletter.com forward slash freelance pod or one word. The podcast is also on social media. So you can find Freelance Pod on Twitter at freelance underscore pod underscore, on Instagram at freelance pod or one word. And there's a Facebook group. So just search for Freelance Pod. Thanks for listening. There'll be another episode soon. Goodbye.